atrás, ¿cómo? Hola. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a empezar con la segundo grupo de conferencias de Transmedia, eh, organizadas, lideradas esta sección de Transmedia por, por Río Visual. Agradecemos la colaboración de la Alta Consejería TIC del Distrito, eh, toda la organización por parte del Ministerio TIC, que ha hecho posible este evento en todas sus áreas. Eh, vamos a empezar con Ian Gin, que es eh, productor creativo. Eh, productor creativo con 20 años de experiencia en la industria del entretenimiento y los medios digitales. Comenzó a investigar la narración en multiplataformas en el 2004, trabajando con estudiantes desde el 2007 en Media Labs, con diversos prototipos y modelos de producción transmedia. Su empresa, la cual fundó, es eh, Hub of Media en el 2008, en la que desarrolla propiedades intelectuales originales y formatos transmedia. Eh, recientemente realiza, realizó Saliguía 7, el piloto de un thriller de ciencia ficción extensivo para varias plataformas. Ian es un gran orador eh, y frecuente moderador en eventos internacionales, estuvo presente por ejemplo, en TDX Media, ha estado presente en Power to the Pixel, en el Festival de Cannes, en el Festival de Cine de San Sebastián, eh, en Ámsterdam, en Vox. Eh, bueno, es mentor de productores y realizadores en medios de varios países eh, en, en, a, a quienes asesora en sus proyectos. En, en el 2010 fundó el Transmedia Learning Network, una organización sin ánimo de lucro, cuyos miembros incluyen a un grupo internacional de escuelas de cine y medios para iniciarlos en la formación del Transmedia. Entonces, los dejo con Ian Gin. Bienvenido. Thank you. Welcome, Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you all had a good lunch. So I'd like to spend this session So I'd like to spend this session talking about indie transmedia projects. These aren't projects which are funded by a broadcaster. They're not projects which are funded by brands. I do both of those pro types of project uh, and I use the revenues from them to develop and produce and research my own indie projects. I've been in digital media for around about 25 years, and the five ideas which I want to share with you this afternoon are ones which have become clear to me over that, uh, over that time. So most of these indie projects are projects which are started by us. They're our passion projects. They're the things that we really want to do. And so the first thing that I'd like to just spend a little time talking about is why. Why would we do that? And I think the answer comes down to the fact that storytelling and organizing play, whether it's a game or a contest, but storytelling and play have been around a lot longer than our modern entertainment and media industries. And so at the time before the media industry was as strong and as ever present as it is today, all projects were, media, uh, were indie projects. If somebody wanted to put on a play for their local community, then it was a question of getting down and doing it. So with these projects which I'm talking about, these indie projects, all of the elements that we work with have been done before. And what's new is how we're bringing them together and mixing the channels and being able to distribute them and get them out to audiences. So why indie? Why Because I've made movies, I've made TV series, I've done a lot with interactive media. Why is it that I go back to uh, uh, indie projects now? And it's very much to do with the fact, it's very much to do with the way that the entertainment industry is organized. And this statement might sound hard, but the, to me, the truth of a lot of the, and I have a lot of respect for the work that Jeff Gomez does and his whole team, and they do some great work. But I think that the, pos the potential uh, of multi-platform, multi-channel, 
uh, digitally enabled, self-distributed projects has a lot more potential than the mainstream entertainment projects that we've seen today. And I, what I want to not see happen is the same kind of thing that happened in the games industry where video game consoles offered so much potential for a lot of uh, very innovative types of gaming, but the, the possibilities have been channeled down to a very few uh, formats and genres. So my aim is to find ways to broaden the types of work that are being made. And in that, in that, I think, I see indie transmedia raising a lot of very provocative questions to do with entertainment and creativity. And I don't mean the entertainment industry, but entertainment and, and creativity. And um, the point is that as indie makers, we can disregard the rules of established channels and play the game on our own terms. <coughs> so using readily available tools like everything from YouTube to mobile phones and um, some of the other platforms which I'll show you, we can already do a lot. And I think the aim here is to enable and work on the emergence of a new aesthetic which, is to, which we can call, say, a trans, uh, maybe a transmedia aesthetic. So my first idea that I'd like to introduce here is to pick your projects based on the excitement that you feel for them. Because working on indie projects is going to cost you a lot. It's going to cost you a lot of, it's going to hurt your wallet. It's probably going to hurt your life relationships. It's not going to be good for your peace of mind. So you better choose something to work on uh, that you feel really passionate about. And don't try and second guess what the market might want. So this is the first idea. Pick something that, that really excites you. Now, the name of the talk was how to keep control of indie projects. So the second idea that I want to talk a little bit about is the idea of control, because you obviously can't control everything. Because if you try to control everything, then your team wouldn't be able to do anything. And that's, you can find a model for that in any project-based work which has got ways of doing things which are well understood. And a good example of it uh, would be filmmaking, where you have a well-oiled, well-understood production pipeline and a production methodology where numbers of specialists can focus on their own uh, areas of responsibility. And say a producer who's responsible for the overall success of getting the thing made still doesn't try and control all aspects. And that's the same with, uh, with transmedia. So it's important for you, as you begin to work on indie transmedia projects, to decide for yourself what it is that you want to keep control of. Here are, some, um, here are four of many parameters that you could say for you, for your project, are aspects that you want to keep control of. And just to run down them very briefly, if you're, if you're initiating a transmedia project, the vision and the key decisions on story might be one where you say, that's mine. And I might have a writer's team around you, uh, but the decisions on story are one which I'm keeping um, a hold on. Taking a slightly more helicopter view, because most transmedia projects don't only have story, but have many uh, different types of media which are going to be used, you might say that the creative process of development is one that you want to keep hold of. Taking a more abstract view, you might say, whatever happens, I believe in the value of this project and I want to keep control of the IPR, the intellectual property rights. And you might say that what I want to do is um, be, be the person that's going to choose which channels uh, that um, the project is going to be distributed on. So in order to kind of form an idea for yourself about which areas of control are important, it's, it's also useful to start to ask yourself what it is that you're trying to achieve with your projects. Because the things you're trying to achieve are going to support the choices you make about what you're going to control. And uh, in the project, which I'm going to show you of mine, <coughs> it was very clearly an experiment. I believe that um, a lot of the work that we do in the early days of developing these kind of projects are experiments to find in the same kind of way that if you're developing a video game, you'll do play testing. So there'll be uh, scenarios of the video game um, 
uh, written and maybe prototyped, and then even prototyped on paper, and then a group of designers and, uh, and players will play test those ideas to find out how playable they are. So one of the areas of control here, and one of the things that you might want to try and achieve, is an experiment which is well defined, so that before you start, you might already know, okay, I want to know about more about how multi-platform narrative really works, or I want to understand how live playable uh, events work. Um, one of the things you might be uh, willing, uh, aiming to achieve um, would be creating, creating the intellectual property. You might be uh, involved with a project that has a lot to do with social awareness. So it might be social storytelling. So these are the kind of things that you need to ask yourself and define quite well for yourself. What is it that we're trying to achieve? But then within that, I would also say, be prepared to share this project st strategically because if you um, get out and start to talk about your project and maybe do some early prototyping and you have some material to show, there can often be that point where you get offered uh, support by a channel or support by a brand and you might need to make a clear decision to share some of the core of this project in order to make the whole thing run uh, more quickly. So my second idea for you is to be clear about what it is that you want to control and those areas that you don't choose to control, make sure that you have a team around you who you trust and who probably can do things better than you, which might be uh, marketing, that might be uh, fundraisers, but to make sure that you have those people around you and your team that you trust and that uh, you're going to allow to have control over parts of the process and then your job is to create a condition in which those people can really excel and do the best that they can do. So my third uh, idea for you is to do with understanding what project success means. Because if you can't say what the success of this project is going to be, then logically you can't know when you achieve it. Now you could look at uh, this list of possibilities, there are many others, um, to start to begin to define what success might mean. It might be that you want to establish your property because we all know you can't um, control or defend ideas. So by taking an idea for a transmedia uh, project and beginning to give it body, by, by giving it media, you're establishing your property not just as an idea but as a, a reality and people respond to that. You'll find that you'll attract writers, media makers, sponsors, channel partners, because you've already started to make. And so it's very important to move your project off the page in a very specific set of ways, which I'll uh, outline a little bit. And by doing that, the second idea is that you establish your role as author. So that even if you do, uh, even if your project does grow, you have a position for yourself as, the, as at least one of the authors, and you'll be at the table at that. By um, getting, by one of your, uh, one of your um, uh, aims might be to show what you can do. It could be to uh, have media that you can show to sources of finance. So you might choose to make a small part of the project and then be able to take it out and see if you can get it financed. And for me, what's very interesting in a lot of these R&D projects is to uh, attract audience and find out whether or not the storytelling and the play that I think uh, are the areas that I'm focusing on uh, actually work or are interesting. That leads then, the way that I do this, the way that I, I would recommend is to describe the vision that you have for this project. So in, tr in, uh, in defining what the success of the project is, distill it as a project vision. And uh, clearly those kind of elements you want to describe in that are intentions and goals and the strategy that you have for the project. So my third point for you is to describe and communicate your vision, to develop it and communicate it to all parties in a consistent way. Now I'd like to show you what that means for me. This is, um, this is one of my own passion projects which I've been working on, um, I started working on it in 2009. Uh, the pilot, uh, which I'll show you a little bit later, uh, was run over a four week period in 2011. And what Solidia 7 is, as a sci-fi thriller, uh, 
the big project which I'm working towards is a piece of immersive locative theater. And what I mean by that is um, a warehouse sized space in which I can tell parts of the live uh, story that I want to tell. Actually, I'll leave this for, a, I have a slide which explains it a little better. So my thriller includes locative theater, uh, pervasive story and game events, social media narratives in a web series, um, a whole series of novels and e-books, uh, mobile application and content, and a couple of feature films. And that's not all going to get made in one year. Where it comes down to, for me, and these are the four areas that I personally, creatively, am most interested in, is storytelling, which meets gameplay, which meets life-scale live events, and um, includes social narratives and digital media. Those four areas coming together are the kind of projects which I'm most attracted to, and they're actually the kind of projects which I also get involved with when I do brand project work. So if I, to show you another perspective on Syllogia, here's a, um, I hope you can all see this. I don't actually have a screen that I can point to. Um, okay, so you've each got different screens around the room, but what you can see here is there is a timeline along the bottom of the screen, which runs from 2011, when the first pilot was run, to 2020. So I have a 10-year horizon for this project. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means, because many, many uh, uh, transmedia projects, which are complex and have a whole series of uh, uh, media that you want to make, I don't believe that even studios can plan 10 years ahead meaningfully, but I know that I can't, so how do I deal with it? And I want to explain that a little bit, uh, how, I, how I work with this. But just to explain this slide first, you can see that in 2011, on the bottom line here, there's the first pilot. And, I, and I've got a, a, a few slides to explain that, so I'll come back to that in a while. And you can see that in 2015, on that same bottom line, there's another pilot which is going to happen, another uh, small module of content, which is, again, story R&D. The line above that, oh, I think I can show it to you like this. Yes, so uh, each of those first two elements are R&D and playtesting. They're, they're where we've developed the idea of this story and gameplay to the point that we want to work with audiences to find out what's working. The, Next line is a series of uh, novels and ebooks and graphic novels. Now, um, I'll come back and explain why I'm working on those as well. The line above it is the, uh, and you can see that that's targeted for 2015, and it has a budget, it has a seven figure budget, so it's a little bit more than $2 million uh, that I need to make, what I want to make. And it's a large scale piece of theater which has got digital play inside it, uh, it has live playable events for audience and players. It has a mobile app, social media, and a, and, a, and a web series. And the idea will be that part of the story is being told in a web series, uh, and at a certain point, the uh, characters in this web series are using an app which you can download, and at, uh, further into the web series, there's a call to action where audience can go to the large-scale theater, which will most likely be in London, and it's a ticketed event and basically, it's like a Broadway show for the gamer generation. So that when they go into this event, uh, it's free-form locative theater with a lot of digital screens around, and their app is still being used to interact with the story. And then further down the line, I want to uh, create a couple of low-budget movies ar around this story world. So what this actually means for me, so this is the plan. And this is the vision. This is what I talk to uh, funders and my creative teams as we work on these different elements. And what it means in terms of what it will take, you can see here, after the first R&D element, there's a signpost. And the reason that there's a signpost there is that I did that pilot after three years of only working in transmedia. And it was the largest thing, you'll see it when I show it a little bit uh, later, but it was the largest thing that I had done uh, and it took me quite a few months after we'd done that to take it apart and to really understand what I'd learned. And one of the ways that I learned, uh, one of the ways I could do that was to workshop a lot. So I worked with a lot of other creators, which forced me to explain what I'd been doing. 
And it was a great, writing, a, a great learning process for me. The next uh, set of icons along this timeline you'll see are pencils to do with writing because right from 2012 and up until now, I've been working on the next piece of playable media. I'm actually beginning to work on my first novel. Uh, the idea was that there'd be another writer that would work on the first novel for me, but uh, I'm enjoying it too much. Uh, and above that, there are the, there's the beginnings of planning for the, um, this piece of locative theater. What that means, and this is why I'm talking about the uh, indie projects grab your life, what it means is that I've organized the creative work that I do so that at least 50% of my time is free for working on this project. So all of my professional work funds this. I'm going to come back and I'm going to show you some, uh, some more content around this project. But what that actually, what that means though is how can I possibly, uh, just to drop back here, I can't, I can't possibly plan for this whole 10 years, right? So it's, um, uh, it's an impossible feat for me because I don't have unlimited finance to say, in this year I'm going to do this and, and, and move through it as if I was a studio. So how do I, how do I um, uh, deal with that? And the way that I have developed to deal with this is to break the whole project down into manageable pieces. And that means adopting something which I call an installment approach. And they're, they're very, you can understand them in terms of episodes of stories or the level that you would play in a certain game. So each of the um, uh, installments which I make, like the little piece of R&D which I'll show you, are all transmedially architected. And I'll come back and explain a little bit what I mean by transmedia architecture. But each are transmedially architected to work on their own. Uh, and it's like this. Installment-based design, as I call it, is a practical solution to the complexity of thinking about all these multi-platform projects. Each installment is fundable, and at the time that you're making it, you only know so much about your story world. Some people might think you can sit down and define a whole story world which goes off to 10 years into the future, and I find that quite a poverty-stricken idea because it means that all the things that you do along the way, you're not actually learning anything new. So I think that there is a, definitely an overarching line that I can describe, which I put on that uh, timeline, but all the steps that I make along the way, if they're really teaching me something about the way the audiences respond to my content and about the way that they want to play, those results should feed back into uh, the work that I'm doing. So you only know so much, your thinking will change and develop, and these kind of installment-based uh, episodes, which typically for me are one year, um, are manageable. I can understand a one-year horizon. A one-year horizon to me feels like a movie almost. I can do that. So to take a little bit uh, of a closer look uh, at the first installment, which was the pilot on that timeline, this is a zombie sci-fi thriller. So we all have our little passions, and mine are sci-fi zombies. And um, what I wanted to keep control of uh, in this episode was the um, key decisions on story, the creative process and development, and IPR. So if you think about that list that I had of all the things that you might want to control, these were the things that I felt I wanted to hold on to. So to understand the story a little bit, um, I should say that the pilot uh, was funded by the Dutch Media Funds, which is an innovation funding for new types of media. Uh, it allowed me to hire a small team of writers to work with, and those, those writers that I, I brought on board had written for television and film, but they'd also done a lot of uh, digital production and games. Um, so the pilot that we were working on was clearly story-driven. Now this story tells three narratives. It tells the story of a group of teenagers uh, in Amsterdam who began to display uh, symptoms of an unknown sickness. And the second narrative um, were a group of young guys who um, thought that, that what they were looking at was some kind of zombie breakout. Uh, and they saw that in the city there wasn't uh, open 
communication from the authorities about what was going on. So they set out to try and find out what was going on. And the third narrative was, is the reaction of society to, um, to this, what is perceived to be a zombie breakout. And in there, there are a series of sub-narratives. Now, to explain this a little bit more clearly, I'll show it to you like this. Um, so we have these three narratives that I just explained. Uh, kids becoming ill, uh, other kids trying to find out what's going on, and reactions of society. All three of those only meet uh, in live events. So if you think back to my slide, I'm interested in storytelling and gameplay, live events, and uh, the kind of social, story, social narratives which happen um, on, online. But the three narratives in this pilot only came together at live playable events, which felt a little bit like pervasive storytelling and a little bit like an ARG. So we told the story in detail of two of the kids that were getting ill, a, a guy and a girl, and we uh, told that story through a series of um, uh, Facebook narratives. We created a community page because as part of our story, these kids, when they got ill, walked away from their home. And one of the mothers started a Facebook uh, community page called Missing Crystal. Uh, and that allowed us to mimic about 100 other parents that felt that their kids had also disappeared and they wanted to find out what was going on. Then we had our two heroes, our um, protagonists. Uh, we gave them a story blog and we gave them uh, um, a web series which uh, um, was used to, uh, uh, it was embedded in the story. So we, we gave them uh, a web series and we gave them uh, Twitter accounts and we gave them uh, also uh, Facebook um, narratives. Now, if you remember what I said at the beginning, a lot of these kind of indie projects can be made with uh, readily available tools, and everything that we're doing here are tools which are available to most everyone. The third narrative, we had a, a SWAT squad, um, and a, a group of, power, uh, of um, a military uh, police whose job it was, was to clean up uh, and keep a lid on the breakout of this sickness. And in that squad, we had two characters that you can see here. One is uh, on the top, uh, the leader of one of these SWAT squads, who's a rogue character and actually plays a longer story arc. And he's part of the story which I take on to the next um, uh, installment of this story world. And the second uh, character, and you can see on these little um, uh, windows uh, on the mind map here, he was a forensic scientist that was attached to the SWAT squad and was conflicted by the way that kids were being uh, incarcerated and locked up without any due process of law. And he started to leak information, and he actually leaked information to uh, um, our two uh, heroes. So they found out story information from him. It was a way of us getting story out to our, uh, to our audience. So we set all of this up without any live audience. We spent three months putting a lot of this in place without anyone knowing that it was there. And then we had the first live event, which was a group of seven zombies which appeared at a very large music festival near Amsterdam. We had a deal with one of the TV broadcast companies uh, that they were going to support us in uh, pre providing some television time for us. And at midnight on the first day of this music festival, one of the better known uh, presenters on Dutch TV, um, uh, he had 400,000 people uh, watching him, and he said, guys, I don't know what's going on, but um, there are zombies on the festival grounds. And as he said that, our zombies came into shot, our two heroes turned up and said, uh, Eric, this is what's going on, there are zombies all over Amsterdam, you have to become safe. So they moved him out of shot, he could carry on with his TV show, We'd had 45 seconds of exposure, and within 15 minutes, we had 20,000 hits because people Googled zombies in Amsterdam, and when they did, they found the top layer of all these different sites that we put in place. They found the story blog, uh, and they found that the protagonists had tweeted earlier in the day that they'd heard that there were zombies in, uh, in the music festival and were going there. Uh, and so we had, um, from a standing start, 20,000 people looking at our story world. And within there, there's, a, there's a, a lesson to be learned about how you have to operate if you don't have a contract with mainstream entertainment channels 
that you can break into them, that you can create content in such a way that's attractive to, in this case, the music industry, uh, the music festival, and the reports that they were giving, and they would work with us, and they, they exposed the story to us. So at this point, we'd gone live. Two days, uh, or the next day, the day after this, the, this had happened, our two protagonists tweeted that they'd got a tip-off that something was going to happen in one of the parks in Amsterdam. Now, they had, in our story world, they'd had that tip-off from uh, the forensic scientist that was leaking information. And so they told our new audience, something's going to go down at 3 o'clock on, on Saturday afternoon in the West Park in Amsterdam. And what we did, we set up a piece of live theater in which there was going to be a SWAT squad swoop to pick up a whole group of zombies. We didn't know what was going to happen, but what I can tell you did happen is that uh, um, uh, this was the first... So after that event, we were running for four weeks, and every weekend we had one more event. And what happened was that around about 175 uh, people turned up. They turned up to, to play with us, to take part in our world. Some of those people were, they wanted to believe that this was an alternative reality game, and others were just very curious to see what kind of storytelling was going on. Some of them, in the days beforehand, had felt that it was very likely to be a, a kind of a brand promotion. And when they realized that it wasn't a brand promotion, that we were just telling a story for them, uh, they became highly excited and committed and loyal to our story. So we had 175 people that watched a 15-minute piece of theater that happened. Uh, they asked us loads of questions afterwards, trying to find out if, if it was an ARG. They tweeted. They took hundreds of photos and videos, which were part of the content that they distributed for us. So there we were starting our four-week live series of events. And in between each of those events, we had um, uh, social narratives that were being told on all the different channels. I can tell you that um, within these four weeks, we had um, uh, around about 55,000 views. Um, we had about a little bit less than 2,000 fans that were really committed, that were every day asking what was going on and speculating what might be the reason and creating content with us. Um, we found that the webisodes really worked for us. Uh, they were telling stories in quite complex ways. And Facebook functioned for us as a narrative channel much, much more effectively than I'd expected. I thought that our two story blogs, one being the, uh, the Z, uh, zombie alarm story blog, which was the way that our two heroes were telling their story, and the second story blog being ZLeaks, which was this website that our forensic scientist was releasing information, I thought, I planned, that that's where a lot of people would go to get story. But actually what was going on was that um, uh, both our characters and some of our audience were picking up content from those story blogs and reposting it on Facebook. And it was on Facebook that all of the communication, all of the, co all of the conversations happened. They didn't happen on the comment pages of the blogs at all. They happened in uh, Facebook flow. And I think that that was very much to do with the fact that Everyone was looking at Facebook every day. The story was being developed, delivered to them, and, it was, and they were used to conversation and commenting there. So I'm much more committed to Facebook as a, as a narrative uh, channel than I was before. So we've got to this mind map. The, to finish the mind map, we had um, what happened was that we were picked up by the press in ways that were different than I'd expected. Um, what I hadn't thought of was that at the... Um, uh, music festival, there would be hundreds of uh, rock photographers, and they picked up because our, our zombies look great. We, so, as I said, I had about 130,000 uh, euros, which is about $170,000 to run this project, uh, and I'd spent about 30,000 euros on zombie makeup. I had two guys that were uh, members of the makeup team for Lord of the Rings because I wanted the zombies to work in a very close proximity. and. Um, and they looked so good that the rock photographers loved them. And we found ourselves on the front screen, the home pages of a whole lot of news uh, channels uh, on a couple of magazines and uh, newspapers. And then what happened uh, was that the last live event, which was at the first moment that our zombies publicly ate flesh, uh, I ran that live event in front of the oldest church in Amsterdam. Uh, and that created quite a lot of... Um, people got quite upset by it. And, uh, and so we were on uh, uh, both the... Amsterdam uh, TV as well as national TV 
But the net result for me was that it exposed us to another 750,000 viewers. So I didn't mean it to happen, and it created quite a lot of friction for a few days, but it worked. In terms of getting audience, it really worked. And that was another one of those moments of breaking into the media channel, into the everyday media stream, by doing things in such a way that it's... I, I don't believe in hoaxing. It's not a question of pretending something's real. In fact, I think that that doesn't work. Um, but it's certainly being bold enough uh, and working in a quality that you can attract that kind of um, attention from uh, mainstream press. Oh, so I can just see that, this, that last piece. So now you can see the, the, the press and the, and the TV. So I'd like to run a um, two and a half minute uh, video just to give you a kind of a sense of what that pilot looked like. It's in Dutch language with English subtitles, hopefully. Oh. Okay. Jules, en dit is Max. En samen bestrijden wij de zombie-apocalyps. Ja, wij zijn dus van Zombie Alarm en we komen jullie waarschuwen. U bent onlangs op de hoogte gesteld van het initiële infectiviteitsonderzoek omtrent de recent gesignaleerde subjecten in onze hoofdstad. Houd ze niet langer vast. Uh, organiseer dus noods een wekelijkse controle. Ze hebben niks gedaan. Stop! We weten jou en je vrienden te vinden. Ik wil maar één keer waarschuwen. So, uh, I can go into detail on um, a lot of what we learned from uh, that pilot. Um, I don't have the time now to do it. What I can tell you is that the most committed of our um, player audience, when that agent went rogue and captured the forensic scientist, the guy in white, because he realized that he was the one that had been leaking a lot of information, and he carried them off in the van, we scripted that before we started the project. And we'd filmed the last scene that you saw, where the zombies rip the entrails out of the, um, uh, of the forensic scientists. It was one of the kind of big production pieces that we had. But we'd learned in the four weeks we were running this that our audience wanted the production to be darker than we'd first written it. And so we, we rewrote about 40% of the project based on the feedback and the conversations that we were having online with our audience. And we decided that one of the two heroes would get kidnapped at the same moment, which is when you saw the, the, the SWAT um, uh, agent punch uh, one, of the, one of the kids. He was also thrown in the van and taken off. And what happened at that point that we hadn't expected was that the most committed of our fans, all, a group of them, 
started to post on Facebook as well, uh, okay, this has got really bad now, we have to rescue Max. And they wanted that. They wanted that playtime. They wanted that playable moment. But we'd, first of all, we were three and a half weeks into the fourth, four weeks of the project. Everyone was pretty exhausted because it was a very complex thing to make and we didn't have a production pathway. It just meant that we were all working like 20 hour days. Uh, we, we didn't have the budget to reset things, but what I could have done and what I would do in the future at those kind of moments, I'd have gone back to the disused paint factory where we shot the scene before we even started this production. I'd have reset it even if it didn't look the same. I'd have put Max there and I'd have told those kids that wanted to play with us at 2 o'clock at night you have to go and rescue him. And they'd have loved it. And being able to respond to those moments, I think, were, was one of the biggest uh, lessons that I had. I have a whole bunch which I can talk about some other time. Uh, um, but to continue here, my f my, so my fourth of the five uh, ideas that I had for you is to break down the project idea that you have for your transmedia project, to break it down into installments. So you might see the project as one whole thing, but avoid trying to talk about it as one whole thing, telling the whole story way off into the future, uh, because it also becomes very difficult for all partners, writers um, and funders and channel partners to follow this story off 10 years in the future. They can't, they can't follow that way. And that's why it's your job maybe to hold, to be the holder of that vision. But when you break the story down into smaller parts, right from the concepting stage and you make them into episodes, the episodes you can talk about. The episodes you can fund and you can say we're going to make that next year and you can budget it as well. And you can say what you want to learn from it and once you've learned it, you can then also report on it so that everyone learns from it. Which is why I've been running workshops to explain what we did, how we did it, what we learned, what kind of production tools we made, used, uh, what we did well, what we, what we didn't do well, um, what we're going to do next. And in other words, take the public money that we've been given to innovate with and share the results. So moving on to the fifth and last of the ideas I'd like to share with you. Um, our job, if we're going to work on independent projects, our job is to develop a creative clarity which um, amplifies uh, the professional approach that we're taking to our own work that places us as a, as a professional around the table with the other professionals that we may well be talking to about our project. And um, I don't often use quotes in, pre in presentations, but here's one that, I really, that really speaks to me, which is from an architect called Christopher Alexander. He's quoted very widely often because he had very far-reaching uh, and, and radical ideas about the nature of architecture and the way that people actually want to live. But what he said here, clarity of form cannot be achieved until there's first clarity in the designer's mind and actions. And it's our responsibility to be uh, as professional and as disciplined as it requires in order to be able to write effectively for cross-media and to be able to plan effectively and to communicate and to have the resilience and the staying power to get our works done. So I'd like to share with you what my uh, position is as a creative and why I work the way I work. And I've kind of distilled this down into uh, a process which um, I'm, I'm beginning to teach more often as well. Um, which is um, called Experience Design for Game and Story World. So what it does is it brings transmedia storytelling and experience design together. Uh, and I don't really talk about transmedia as a noun. I talk about it as an adjective. So transmedia storytelling, transmedia architecture, and transmedia structure seems to me to have some kind of value, whereas just the word, it's transmedia, doesn't really do very much. It doesn't say very much. So to talk a little bit about transmedia storytelling and experience design, um, to take experience design first, there's a point of view which is that um, audience create meaning for your work. So you as an author may well write the most profound book and then have that published and distributed. But it's the audience that completes the understanding of your work with their own insights. This is a phenomenological viewpoint and one which I really 
believing deeply because if you read a book and then you come back to that book 10 years afterwards, the experience of reading the book is different and the book's not changed, so the only thing that's changed is you. So you bring meaning to all media uh, objects. So experienced design has got very much to do with the fact that you're putting audiences at the center of the work and you're realizing that while you're setting up a whole kind of media uh, umbrella for them to be immersed in, uh, they're the ones that create the meaning. And the second part of this is that um, uh, there's a the media researcher called Shel no, I have to come back with his name, has defined six dimensions of experience which I think um, are, are very useful. And those six dimensions are to do with the time and duration of any event, the interactivity that you're offering audiences, the intensity of the, of the experience, uh, the breadth and consistency that you're putting in place for people to, uh, to um, become immersed in the world that you're offering them, the sensorial parts, so the different types of senses that you're uh, engaging of theirs, the triggers, the cognitive triggers that you're putting into the environment, things that they'll uh, engage with which will start to trigger ideas for them, and the significance and meaning that you bring and that they bring to it. They're the, they're the dimensions that you have to work with in experience design. The next part of this in terms of transmedia um, storytelling is the structure. And that means the internal structure of the um, transmedia product projects that you're developing. And that's got everything to do with game design and gameplay. In other words, these are elements that we know. These are things which are already out there. Game design and gameplay, narrative and story structure, interaction design, theater and performance, and a whole lot of other things. If you start to use uh, apps, it's to do with the usability design. If you start to use, um, well, so you can see what I'm talking about here. The transmedia um, uh, structure is, a, is a, um, a compound of the knowns of many other media that you'd be using. And then if you talk about how you're going to put um, transmedia architecture and make sense of that, it's to do with, on a timeline, the timing and the pacing and the phasing of how you're using different media to, re to reveal parts of the story and play and the choices of media you're making and the sequencing. So where is the structures, the internal part, the, um, the architectures to do with that external? So my fifth and last idea then is to define your long-term creative focus. Let it emerge from the work that you're doing. And I'll put those together as these five ideas which um, certainly five ideas which you can either use or throw away. They're just what I have picked up, which I try and use, which I try and make sense of the work that I do. Um, be excited, be selective from what you want to control, communicate the vision that you have for a project, be practical, uh, and develop your creative focus. So, thanks, and... Thank, Thank you very you. much. And um, the easiest way to get in touch with me is uh, through Twitter. You can direct message.